Welcome to the Soft Life with Sadi Baddies. Sadi Baddies is the antidote to mental health stigma, and this podcast is hosted by yours truly, Priscilla O. Adjman. We are a virtual sanctuary centering Black and multiracial people, and we prioritize the mental and emotional nourishment that is the foundation of collective healing in our communities. Thank you for being here. Hello, and welcome back to the Soft Life Podcast, Baddies. I'm so happy to be back, and we are we are really winding down here. It is already July. It's July 6th, and we are actually going to take a much-needed summer break from recording new episodes so that we can come back and feel rejuvenated and ready to start our next season. We already have guest episodes recorded for next season, so... We've already got the ball rolling, but I am excited to take this creative rest because I've been feeling it, to be completely honest. I've been feeling it, and I'm excited to see what comes out of that creative rest that I think everyone who is, especially a digital creator, you tend to put out a lot of content Um, very quickly every week or every day even so I'm excited to see what happens when we hit reset and we take a a much needed summer break so last week we had the amazing Amani Rakia on the podcast and she is such a light I really really loved this episode I felt like it was like a love letter to anyone who's in their 20s and I wish that I had this episode when I was like 21 or 22 it would have helped me to feel so seen and I'm very grateful for her coming on the show and sharing her light as well as all of our guest episodes we've had some really beautiful and lovely and vulnerable conversations this season I also was switching up the format of combining both guest episodes and solo episodes and I think I found my rhythm and I feel really good about it so I hope that you've been enjoying this season I am also looking forward to next season we also have like I mentioned some awesome guests lined up so stay tuned for that in other news as mentioned in a previous episode we are obviously have our newsletter and following us on social media is the best way to keep up with the podcast to see what we're up to this summer. If you follow me on my personal Instagram, which a lot of you do, hey, say hey, if you find me from the podcast, um, I will be, you know, living my soft girl life as much as I can this summer, obviously still working, but your girl's got to do what she got to do, okay? You know, and I'm looking forward to just taking a deep, Wusa and relaxing and letting go a little bit. Um, we have a lot happening this summer still, even though we are kind of taking this break from uploading episodes. If you are in New York City, we are having an in-person event quite soon. So again, if you're not on our news or mailing list, or if you're not following us on socials, this is a great time to, it's also a great time to catch up on episodes. Um, while there is a bit of a lull um, in sharing and uploading episodes, this is a great time to kind of catch up and see what you've been missing. So this is a listener's episode, and this is really, this is for y'all, okay? We ask on our story if you had any questions, and oh my gosh, there was so many questions and so many good questions. So I'm really excited to just have like a fun, lighthearted episode to help us to ease into this uh, little mini hiatus. And again, we're not going to be gone for like months and months or anything like that. But this is like a, you know, a few weeks of a hiatus that we'll have. Um, and side note, we just have so much that... I can't even share yet because it's like, ooh, it's still under wraps, but I'm just very, very excited to come back um, to the podcast um, later towards the end of the summer. But we had so many good questions and I don't even know where to start. Okay, let's just dive into it. So one of the first questions we got when we asked you 
what do you want to hear for this last episode? Any advice, any suggestions, or just what's been on your mind? And it's it's a range. We have some questions about toxic jobs. We have relationship questions. We have friendship questions, podcasting, and then, you know, questions for myself. So let's start with the question about what my human design is. So someone asks, what is your human design profile and Enneagram? So for those of you who don't know what human design is, human design is basically, uh, it's a self-knowledge system. So if you've ever heard of the Myers-Briggs personality test, That is, you know, a personality that has multiple profiles, but similar to this, human design uses the combination of our birth chart. So when we were born, what time we were born, the location we were born, as well as um, other details about just our natural born given gifts and talents. And also what I have come to understand about human design, it's, it's almost like a map. So there are, I believe, five different types. Yes, there are five different human design types. So there's manifestors, generators, manifesting generators, which I am, projectors, and reflectors. So let's get a little bit of a background as to what human design is and what this means to be a manifesting generator. And if you're curious I will leave a little link in the description where you can take your own human design um, test. But I took my human design test, I believe, sometime last year, and I found out that I am a manifesting generator. So manifesting generators are the second most common type of energy type in the human design system, and they represent about 34% of the global population. So manifesting generators are basically a subtype of generators, and the biggest difference between generators and manifesting generators is that manifesting generators tend to have deep, multifaceted desires, while generators tend to have a more pointed focus. So manifesting generators are notorious and they are known to be the multi-hyphenates of the human design system. And so basically we manifesting generators, which is so true about myself, we manage um, this variety that we always have like this evolving intensity of different desires, different interests, different just we do these deep dives into various subjects and you might know people in your life who are just like, wow, you're just like, it's like you have several things that you are good at, or you can honestly, you can tell a manifesting generator by especially their career and their background. So for me, for example, for those of you who don't know, I've mentioned this before, but my background, my, my actual degree is in, I got my bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in English. And then I got uh, my master's degree in public health. And now I work in digital business consulting and I'm a content strategist. I'm a digital content strategist. I also run Sadie Baddies, which is a digital community and platform and um, a company that creates contents very specifically to remove the stigma surrounding mental health um, and, you know, have a podcast. So there's a lot of different interests that I have clearly. And I think my job career has shown that I have a very nonlinear path. I went from working at a nonprofit to working at a hospital to working at a startup, a biotech startup, and, you know, now landing at a digital consulting agency. And um, that's not really a singular path. Like, for example, if I was a teacher and I have always been a teacher and I have just maybe taught in different schools, but I've always been in the education field, that would probably make me similar to someone who's a generator. So someone who has one area in their life where they're really focused on, or they have an area in their life where they are an expert on. Whereas for me, I think my life in the 30 years that I've been alive has already shown that I am not meant to be put in a box. And honestly, I really do think that 
10 years from now, my life is going to look completely different. I might be doing something completely different than I originally intended, or I might completely switch gears. And the biggest thing with manifesting generators is being able to trust your gut. And when you get that full body yes to actually follow that full body yes. So that is something that I have learned um, about being a manifesting generator is when I am doing something, especially if I'm picking up a new project or career or a skill or even a hobby, I need something that's going to light me up and I need to always root it back into my why. Um, And so it's very interesting learning about my human design type. Um, Some other traits about being a manifesting generator is that we are multifaceted. As mentioned, we're multi-hyphenates, we're passionate, energized, creative, tenacious, and excitable. And I think that pretty much describes me in a nutshell. So that is my human design type. I do not know my Enneagram because I tried to take the quiz, but I wasn't able to find one that I felt was pretty accurate there was like a few that had different types of questions which I guess is you know there's depends on who's providing the test but I want to take the official one (laughs) and so I'm planning I'm looking to find the official Enneagram test and I will get back to y'all maybe that'll be like my like little Easter egg that I throw in for next season and see if you remember um this question so Yeah, so that is my human design profile. And as far as my other personality slash um, zodiac chart slash information, I forgot my Myers-Briggs type. I believe it's ENFJ, but don't quote me on that. Um, I am a Sagittarius sun. I am a Scorpio moon and rising. So I have a lot of water placements um, that play around with my fire sun, but that really, honestly, I think the older I get, the more it makes sense to me. When I found out that I was a Scorpio moon and rising, I was like, "Hmm, I don't know if I identify with this, but now I'm like, oh, I definitely, definitely identify with all of those placements. So yeah. Um, we'll leave the human design quiz for you to try on your own. Okay, so the next question is, how do you deal with a breakup when you know it's for your own benefit? Ooh, so this this question, this is hard because breakups are not easy. And I will say that when it comes to having a breakup and you know that it's for your own good, it makes it bittersweet because you want to be you want to be emotionally available however it's hard to do that when you know that it's not the right time for you to open yourself up back yet and i think of course you know it's bittersweet in the fact that you are now leaving your life with this person you are choosing to let go of your life and your experience with this person and now you know you have to kind of pick yourself back up but the sweet part of it is that you get to start over the sweet part of it is that you're choosing yourself and the sweet part is that you are making a really healthy decision for your future self so those are the pros and the cons and honestly I think when it comes to breakups, it's really important to remember that what is for you is not going to pass you by. And what is designed for you, who is designed for you is not going to just let you go. And I think sometimes we forget that everything is a choice and the people that want to be in our lives will be in our lives and they will cement themselves in our lives, obviously in a healthy you know, mature and emotional relationship or romantic relationship. But I think what's really important to remember is that you don't have to chase down what is already yours. It will feel organic. It will feel natural. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to put effort. But I do think that that natural desire, that natural commitment that develops over time with being with the person that you are 
supposed to be with will alleviate a lot of that stress. And when it comes to breakups, it's going to take time to feel like yourself again. It's going to take time for you to feel ready to start dating again or start putting yourself out there. It's going to take time for you to really trust yourself and open up your heart to love. And I think one thing that's really helpful is in that season of singleness or that in that season of choosing to be with yourself is also remembering to nurture yourself and nurture your heart. And what does that mean for you? You know, what does it mean to nurture your heart? That's really up to you to decide, but you know what you need. You know what emotional tools, what emotional support you need. And we can't do all of it alone. I think this is obviously a really good time to lean on family, your support system, your friends. You know, it's summertime. So if this is a recent breakup, like this is also a good time to just spend some time outside as much as you can and just nurture the part of you that needs healing, essentially. Um, And I think knowing that you're making the right choice at the end of the day is what's going to help you to have some hope. And essentially, it's going to help you to realize that you're making the right decision, even if it is really difficult. So if you are going through a breakup, I'm sending you so much love. And of course, just take your time with it. And I think, you know, maybe we'll have an episode on dealing with breakups. Um, Because I know that we've talked about friendship breakups, but we haven't really touched on romantic breakups. We do have a post on breakups, though, on Sadie Baddie. So I will link that post in the show notes for you. Sending you mad love. Okay, so next question is, how do I feel like a baddie again after not feeling like myself for a while? I love this question because I think we forget sometimes that our exterior And how we look and how we carry ourselves or how we're taking care of ourselves, it can affect how we feel inside and vice versa. So I think when it comes to not feeling like yourself, we've all been there. I've been there. Um, And I think it's really important to remember who you are at the end of the day. And that's really what the whole point of Saddie Baddies is, is you can be a Saddie, but you remember that you're a baddie at the end of the day. Like That is the whole point. That is the message. That is the memo. That is the moment. Okay. You remember that you are still a baddie and it's the duality of existing. That's the duality of life is you can be sad, but also realize that at the end of the day, you have a reason to pop out. You have a reason to love yourself. You have a reason to take care of yourself, to nurture yourself. And I think when it comes to not feeling like yourself, or if you've been kind of feeling detached, which I definitely identify with at times, is to take it very slow. And what I love to do when I truly don't feel like myself is I like to go through my camera roll. I like to go through even like my Instagram archive sometimes, but I'll go through my camera roll and I'll just go through my favorites folder. So I don't know about you, but I'm very good with updating my favorites folder. Every time I take a picture that I love, I will immediately favorite it because I don't want to forget how I felt in that moment. And one thing that is so important about coming back home to yourself and feeling like yourself again is to document the moments that you feel most like yourself and refer to those moments often, those moments that you feel embodied, those moments that you feel like a bad bitch, the moments that you feel most like the true you, going back to those moments and remembering who you are and remembering that you are still that person despite your circumstances. That has helped me so many times in my life. And there have been times where I'm like, you know what? Two weeks ago, I was living my best life. Two weeks ago, I was out and about in a really cute outfit, you know, just having fun. And that's still me. That's just a past version of me. And I think remembering that that is still you and not letting your current circumstance define you. And another thing is to change something. And when I say change something, I don't mean go dye your hair neon green. If you want to do that, though, I salute you. Go ahead and do that. But what I'm saying is that changing something 
whether that means changing something in your environment, it could be as simple as doing something in your room and kind of rearranging your furniture in your room. If you don't have money to go buy new furniture, you can rearrange your furniture, you can declutter, you can find ways to make your space feel new and fresh. I do this all the time. I do this honestly, probably every few months, maybe every like six months, I'll just like rearrange stuff in my office, in our home, just in general, it gives you a new light, it it refreshes your space. So that is something that I highly suggest is giving yourself a mini refresh, or it could just be, okay, let me change these sheets. I haven't changed my sheets in a few weeks. Let me change this. Let me wipe down my dresser. Let me, you know, just give yourself a refresh, clean your makeup brushes. And I'm saying that these are little things that we overlook. And of course, cleaning your makeup brushes is not going to make you stop feeling sad or stop making you feel like, oh, I feel hopeless or anything like that. But I'm taking care of your environment and detaching yourself from sometimes, you know, having that distraction, that healthy distraction is what we need to get the motivation to start really taking care of ourselves. So maybe you cleaned your room today and that was the biggest thing, the biggest accomplishment that you had. That's great. And you should acknowledge that. But now, now that you have a space that is able to nurture and support you and be a, you know a sanctuary for you now you can maybe make sure that you have enough food in your body and maybe you're dehydrated you know there's so many reasons why we could not be feeling like ourselves maybe we're spending too much time on social media or maybe we're not being around people that love us enough and Whatever the case is, doing things little by little will really help you to start feeling like yourself again. For me, one solution that has always helped me is being in nature. Nature is so healing. Being outside is so healing. And I think we underestimate the power that nature has to help ground us. And there's a reason why there's a, a anti-anxiety method called grounding, which is literally you putting your bare feet in the grass and the ground and really, really feeling the textures, feeling the sensation of the earth under you. And that has helped so many people, you know, come down from anxiety attacks, come down from not feeling grounded. And it really, really is one of the best ways to help us to remind ourselves of who we are and where we come from. So trying grounding practices, um, you know, obviously switching up your environment or just spending time with people that love you can really help you to feel like yourself again. And I just wish you a safe return back to yourself when you don't feel like yourself. It's this type of grief almost, or it's this type of you start to miss the person that you were. And when you do finally find your way back, it feels so amazing. So I wish you a safe journey back to yourself if that is how you've been feeling lately. Okay, so someone else asked, should I break up with my friend? I feel like she has been using me lately. So this is a very good question. I think that breakups, friendship breakups can be tricky because sometimes we want to break up with a friend because they're no longer serving us or they betray us or maybe you guys just have different values and you drift apart. But I think that when it comes to friendship breakups, when it if it's also something that you haven't communicated ever, this also might be an opportunity to finally have that conversation with that friend. If you feel like your friend has been using you and also in what context, right? So if they have been using you for money, you know, obviously that's a very clear, you know, boundary that you might have and you can just bring it up to them and say, hey, I feel like every time we go out, I spot you and then you never pay me back. Like, I don't think that's right. It could be a number of reasons. And then that's your opportunity to unpack that with your friend if you really value the friendship. But if it's something more, you know, that you have talked to them about over and over again, 
it is really up to you to decide what type of people you want in your life because the the five people that you spend the most time with are going to be the types of personalities that you sur- that you surround yourself with but also these are the types of personalities that can subtly become characters and traits that you may not appreciate over time so it's really important to have people in your life that value you and respect you. And so I personally think that when you are breaking up with a friend, there should be a why. And if it's because you feel used, state your boundary, let them know, hey, I don't like when you do that. I don't appreciate that. And I think having hard conversations with friends is really uncomfortable, but you might find that your friend is really actually open and receptive to you telling them how it is and being honest with them. So don't feel like you have to go through a very uneven or an unbalanced or an un just unhealthy friendship for the sake of it. You don't have to if that's not something that is going to help you in the long run and having an honest conversation with with them about it is is my main suggestion. I think if we don't tell people how we feel, we're they are going to just always be under the assumption that what they're doing is okay. So if you speak to them and then they get defensive or anything like that, then I think it's really up to you to decide if you really want to keep this person into your life. Okay. So the next question is how do I stay grounded while building a nurturing relationship with my partner? Or actually, let me rephrase that. The question is, how do I stay grounded in myself while building a nurturing relationship with my partner? So this is a really, really good question. I love this question because we get so we get bombarded with relationship advice and how to find this in a partner and how to do this. But a lot of times we don't always have conversations about how do we keep ourselves grounded while still building a relationship and nurturing a relationship with your partner. One thing that I believe is the most important aspect of nurturing yourself is having separate lives. And obviously, you know, when you're with your partner, you're spending a lot of time with them you are all up under them, you know, (laughs) as you should. But one thing that's really important is having separate lives. And I mean, having your own set of interests, having your own set of friends, doing the same things that you love to do. If you were somebody that used to love um, going to pottery class before you met your partner, but all of a sudden you stopped going because your partner doesn't like pottery classes, you should still go. There's no reason to stop developing the skills and the interests and the hobbies and the experiences that you once had just because you are in a partnership or in a relationship now. And I think it's so important not to lose ourselves in a relationship. I also believe that having time to yourself, like scheduling out self-care days, scheduling out solo days where you can just be with yourself and um, really nurture your soul. And I do this all the time. I, you know, have been in a relationship with my now fiance for a few years now, and we live together. We have lived together for the last couple of years. And um, I get this question actually a lot just in my you know, among my peers and my my friends sometimes is like, how do we maintain so, so much, you know, individuality while still being really um, close and intimate with each other? And I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, obviously having my own individual interests, but also just having days where you're just solo dolo, you know, if you... <laughs> I actually did that the other day. I went to a coffee shop. Um, My fiance was home and I was like, I'm going to just go to a coffee shop for a little bit and just, you know, get some work done. And then I'll be back in probably a couple hours. And, you know, I didn't have to literally go anywhere, but 
just having time to yourself, having experiences to yourself. I, you know, will go grab something to eat. Like if we are having a busy weekend and he's, you know, running errands or he's has plans with his friends, I will do my own thing. It's it's learning how to not revolve your entire life around your partner and having your own sense of self, um, having, you know, dates with your friends. I think having friendship dates is really important too, because believe it or not, sometimes we feel like we have to do this whole healing journey by ourselves, but really what can make it so much easier is spending time with our loved ones, spending time with the people that care about us, the people that see us and making time for your friends, not neglecting them, you know, when you are in a relationship, because I think we've all had at least one friend in our life who gets a partner, gets a man or whoever, and just like dumps their friends. And I think it's important to still nurture and um, make time to be with your friends and your your chosen family without neglecting your needs. So I think nurturing yourself and grounding yourself is important. And also remembering, again, this goes back to knowing yourself in being very aware of who you are in and outside of the relationship. So maybe in your relationship, you have a certain way of being, but remembering who you are outside of that as well. And I think you can do that in tandem with nurturing your relationship with your partner. And ideally, your partner is on the same wave as you. And ideally, your partner is also working on themselves and and working on self-improvement. And ideally, your partner is looking for ways to nurture themselves and take care of themselves as well as you t- you both taking care of each other. So I think that's one way to help to nurture yourself while or ground yourself while being in a relationship and maintain your individuality. Um, but obviously, you know, making time for date nights, making time for like couples check ins. And that's something that I have found really helpful and useful is having like just couple check ins um, with my fiance and, you know, just like, hey, what's what's been going on? Like, what's on your mind? You know, just kind of doesn't have to be like this homework thing. But I think just having really simple, honest conversations about where where we are with each other and how we're feeling is how you allow the lines of communication to stay open pretty much. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, or one of the questions was, how to deal with a toxic boss? Ooh, this is a good question. So I don't know anyone who has not had a toxic manager or a toxic boss before. I personally have realized that when dealing with a manager or director or someone, your, you know, supervisor, I, first of all, side note, I don't like using the word boss. I don't usually use that word to describe the people that I work with because it's, it's really, I don't know. I don't see it as this hierarchy thing. Obviously, you have people that, you know, have direct reports, but I just think the word boss is so obsolete. And I just also feel like it creates this weird authority complex when it's like, "Mm, this is your manager, you know, and this is your director. These are the people with these titles. But I think having autonomy over your work and the productivity that you show up with at your job is really important. So. I think that having a toxic leader, how about we say that, or a toxic manager at your job can be really, really depressing. Let's start there. Um, it's it's super depressing. It's It really can deplete any ounce of motivation that you have to do the job that you need to do. And number one is to write it down and document it. If you've been noticing your behavior with your manager has been really unhealthy 
or it makes you uncomfortable or just like just threatens your livelihood, definitely documenting it is really important because if this does become an issue long term or you need to, you know, get additional support outside of just you and your manager, then you're going to need to document what exactly is happening. And um, this could just be really you jotting down bullets or keeping a little diary or journal, like what's going on, like, you know, um, and what type of mistreatment is happening, if it is happening. And if your manager or your director is just somebody who's just generally just like not a nice person. I mean, I've had this situation before where it was like, my director wasn't saying anything directly to me it was just overall this like negative experience working with them so I had to learn how to create boundaries and you know um whether it's them pushing you to work late hours that are outside of your scope of work and you pushing back and say actually these are the hours that I'm available or whether them it's them speaking to you in a condescending way you can, you know, say something like if it is like a condescending tone, you can say, I would really actually prefer if we communicated this way. And I think coming with solutions, being solution oriented at work is always a good thing. And um, naturally, if you are just somebody that tends to be quiet or just doesn't want to speak up, it's going to be more challenging. So this is an opportunity for growth. This is an opportunity for you to stick up for yourself and, you know, Last but not least, if this becomes really bad or unbearable, definitely create an exit strategy, create an exit plan of how you plan to essentially leave this this role because you do not deserve to be mistreated at work. And I know that this happens a lot in different fields, but I think one thing that's really important to remember is that you do not have to stay there. If there is a a job or a company and you've tried your best, you've done your due diligence and nothing's changing, leave. You don't have to stay there and be treated poorly. And I know that's really scary to think about in this economy. However, there are still job applications out there. There are still job openings. Companies are still hiring. Recruiters are still working in those LinkedIn messages. <laughs> so there are there's still a demand for work and I, I'm pretty sure almost any field. So don't feel discouraged and not even give yourself give yourself a chance to try and talk yourself out of it. If you really need to leave this toxic work situation in this environment, create an as an exit strategy so that you can do that with ease. And that will allow you to have so much more space, time, freedom, self-assurance than staying in this very dysfunctional work environment. Um, okay, related to the job question, someone asks, how do I stay motivated during my job search? So I think one thing that's really important when it comes to staying motivated is to take it easy, take it one day at a time. And maybe you can have even like a little uh, ritual. I think that adding rituals and routines to things that might otherwise be daunting or scary for us can really help us to feel more prepared and feel ready to take it on in a more confident way. So Um, You know, I think, you know, even creating affirmations of your job search process, like, you know, before you sit down, you could, you know, light a candle, create, make some tea and just tell yourself like there is a job that is aligned for me, waiting for me. And I have the tools and the capabilities to complete this application and just talking to yourself with kindness can be the first step because if you go to sit down to start applying to jobs, you're like, no one's getting back to me. I'm not going to get a job. That is just going to make it so much more difficult. And I mentioned this, you know, before I was actually at this time last year, like in July, 2022, I was unemployed. I had gotten, you know, unfortunately laid off from um, a company and I 
was unemployed for a couple of months and honestly it was like eight weeks but (laughs) um who's counting I was (laughs) but I honestly it was it was difficult so I know how it feels and you know applying for jobs isn't sometimes it can take a big hit to your self-esteem and your confidence as an applicant but I think just remembering that it does take time and staying motivated. I mean, the biggest motivator is you getting and signing that job offer. That's the motivation is at the end of the day is that you can finally, you know, end the process, this liminal space that you're in of looking for a new job and you can rest assured that this is your new role and it's going to invite a lot of opportunities for you. So that is one of my biggest motivations when job searching, but definitely creating little rituals, saying positive affirmations, just inviting to inviting yourself to be positive and think positively about the situation. And of course, you know, I think switching up your environment, sometimes when it comes to job searching, it just becomes this dreadful process because we're sitting in the same place. Maybe you're sitting in your living room or if you have a home office or your bedroom or wherever you are, and it can just feel so draining. So honestly, sometimes switching up your environment, if you can afford to go to a coffee shop, go there maybe once a week. It doesn't have to be every day, but just have one day a week where you can look forward to it. Get yourself a little treat and, you know, just make the process less painful for yourself. However you can, that's within your means, or you can just go to the library and, you know, just focus there for a little bit. You'll be around other people. You can also invite a friend over who might be also in the same predicament. Or if you have a friend that has like a remote job or you can co-work with other folks who are also looking for jobs, whatever the case is, I think just finding ways to stay uplifted because the hardest part really is keeping yourself motivated. Um, That to me, I think has been the biggest challenge. And, you know, obviously getting rejected sucks too. And if you have been applying to jobs, but you've been getting rejected, it's really hard to pick yourself up. But when you take, when you choose not to personalize every rejection or acceptance even, and not personalize it and not create a story behind it as to why you were rejected and not create a whole storyline as to why it's working for you or why it's not working for you. It just makes the task feel a little bit more automatic and a little bit less painful and manual. If you're able to detach a little bit from the outcome, that can help a lot instead of, okay, well, this is this job. I really need it. I really want it. Boom. And then if you don't get it, it's like your world comes crumbling down. So Detaching a little bit from the outcome, I have learned, has been really helpful with staying motivated in my job search. Okay. Someone asked, um, do you have any podcast advice? I don't know where to start. Ooh, well, to be honest, before I started this podcast, I literally, I sat on this idea for a year It took me a whole year to start. And when I say a year, I mean that I had then I had already known I wanted to do a podcast. Actually, my fiance was like, I think you'd be great with a podcast. You should definitely, you know, look into it. And he already had all of the equipment um, for us to start doing it. And so he was kind of like, (laughs) I'm ready when you are, you know, I'm ready to help you. I'm ready to record these episodes with you. And that's just his personality. He's always been very encouraging for me taking that first step. But truly, it took me a year because I kept psyching myself out or I would do like these kind of like test run episodes. And I was like, oh, I don't like the way I sound or, you know, it didn't come easy or naturally for me. And now we're what, 40 episodes later, which is almost 40 hours worth of content and almost 40 hours worth of podcasting. Well, more than that, because that doesn't include editing or anything like that. But, you know, it takes time. And the more that you do it, the better it is. And I actually saw a really helpful TikTok today that was talking about how many of us have all of these 
you know, if you have TikTok or you use Instagram or use any social media, there's people sharing advice left and right. Everybody has advice to share, even if it's from their personal experience. Everybody has advice to share. Yet, how many times do you actually go back and look at that advice like, oh, how do I start a YouTube channel? Oh, how do I actually launch a business? Even though you might have seen a video about it like 200 times. The sometimes what is most beneficial is diving in without having that life jacket, without having all this knowledge base. I do think having a knowledge base is really helpful and it can alleviate some anxiety. But if we spend too much time there, we can have this failure to launch. How many times do we write a great idea in our notes app and never go back to it? Don't let your best ideas die in your notes app. Don't let your best ideas die in just your headspace and not actually make room and create opportunities for it to come into fruition. Sometimes it really is as simple as just taking that first leap. So when I say, how do you start? Literally start. Start with maybe if you want to write out your first episode, great, but you don't have to. You can have it's okay to be bad at something when you first start. It's literally okay to be shitty when you first start at something. I think we tend to judge ourselves because we want things to be perfect as soon as we output them, but that's not the reality of anything, especially things that are creative. Chances are your first piece of literature that you write or your first blog post. I mean, think back to your first Instagram picture is probably super cringe. I mean, minus the fact that we all were using the same like sepia filter or whatever filter we were using at the time back in like 2012. I think it's okay to be bad at something. You know, I have a really good friend of mine who um, is a writer and a producer and they write for, you know, awesome television and movie um, productions now. And if they're listening, they know who they are. But when they first started writing, their writing style was so different than what it is now. And to see their growth is amazing because now they're living their dream. And they were able to literally put together a short film. And I think that's incredible. And it wouldn't have, it, it would have never been they would have never been able to start you know with writing that short film if they hadn't given themselves an opportunity to be bad in the beginning and that's really what it's about it's about starting off small creating these little steps and eventually executing and similar to when it comes to job searching not being too attached to the outcome either. I think with podcasting, you really don't know what you're doing until you start getting a little bit more feedback. And not only that, it's like, it's such a different type of media than creating YouTube videos or creating um, Instagram posts because it's not really social media. It's similar to radio in a way. And so You know, you got people creating kind of their own little radio channel or radio station. And there's a little bit more of a challenge to grasp your listener. There's a little bit less window to grasp your listener because it's long form content and it's very different. But I've loved learning so much about podcasting. Um, I think anything you want to learn about podcasting, you can find on YouTube, you can find on probably Instagram too. Um, You can find it pretty much anywhere. So, you know, don't get too stuck on the knowledge base part of podcasting. It's really just, in my opinion, better to launch and to create something. And, you know, if you don't like it, if you realize it's not for you, you can always pivot. That's fine. But don't get stuck in that like pre pre early phase of not actually executing because I think that's where we get stuck a lot of times. And that's when your ideas can start to feel a little bit stale um, when you just allow yourself to worry about it before you actually put the action towards it. All right. So we have a couple more questions and someone asks, how do you dress 
like a baddie without losing your coin or losing your mind? <laughs> I think this is such a good question. Um, short and sweet, how do you dress like a baddie without losing your mind or your coin? Finding your personal style. When you develop your personal style, it allows you to be very selective about what you're choosing to wear. And I'm actually in this phase right now of kind of rediscovering my personal style at the age of 30. I have been through so many style evolutions in my life. Like if you know, you know, if you knew me in college, (laughs) if you knew me back in college, you know that there was a period of time that you probably only saw me wearing black. Like I had like an all black phase. I was only wearing black all the time. And, you know, now, like, if you were to see me right now, I've got like pink airbrushed nails with like 3D nail art, which is so different than what I would do even a year ago. So just embracing your personal style and finding out what it is. And that really comes through finding sources of inspiration. It comes through just creating outfit formulas, you know, Um, One thing I love to do is create like an outfit formula for myself so that I'm not wasting money on pieces of clothing that I know I'm not going to wear. So for example, I'll give you an example of like one of my uh, my outfit formulas. In the summertime, I'm all about comfort and I don't want to feel hotter than it already is outside. Like today, for example, was like 90 degrees. I was like, I'm hot as hell. I don't want to wear a lot of layers. I don't want to wear like a lot of heavy clothing Paying attention to what fabrics you're wearing is really important. So, you know, for me, an outfit formula would be like a two-piece matching set, you know, linen, very light, breezy, easy, easy to throw on a matching set, right? Boom. That's a way to just kind of simplify and automate, you know, your styling process. But I think also, you know, beyond that, finding unique pieces that are secondhand, um, you know, there's so many different websites now. There's Depop, there's ThreadUp, there's a bunch of websites that have secondhand. Of course, there's like your regular thrift stores, um, vintage stores, but finding secondhand clothing is one of the best ways to create a very unique personal style. I've noticed that, especially in New York, the people that I know that shop vintage or shop like secondhand, they have this really, really dope, like, very unique personal style that you just can't really get anywhere else. And I love that. So, you know, that's also a really good way to save money too, because you're not buying everything brand new. You're not buying everything full price for the most part. And most likely you're probably getting more bang for your buck and it's sustainable. So we love that. Um, Yeah. So I love just doing like very simple alpha formulas. Um, That helps me to not overthink my outfits. Um, Another outfit formula that I wear a lot in the summer is like an oversized button down and maybe like a little tube top underneath or just like, you know, loosely buttoned with like some biker shorts and some sandals, some sneakers, I call it a day. And then obviously your accessories will help to bring out that baddie style because that really is what makes you feel unique and it's very simple. It's really up to you what you define as your personal style. But I have found that creating like very simple alpha formulas um, really helps me to feel more like a main character in my life. And yeah, I mean, I could go, I could really go into it. Um, I love that someone asked this question because I feel like I never get questions about like style and fashion as much as I want to because, you know, topic focus. But yeah, I I like I think that creating your personal style is one way to feel really embodied and just feel like yourself. And maybe it's something that you wear every day. Maybe it's a piece of clothing. Um, I mean a piece of like jewelry that you wear every day. Like I tend to wear the same jewelry pieces um over and over and they just kind of become part of my personal style. And I love it. And I think that it can really help to simplify your styling process every day and your dress up process. Okay. So we've got one more question and question is what is the most challenging aspect of being a podcaster and a content creator? Mm. What do you think about that? 
I think the most challenging aspect of being a podcaster is I would have to say I love podcasting like there's really I don't think there's too many challenges with being a podcaster but I will say I'm gonna be completely completely honest I think doing interviews can be a little bit challenging in terms of just the initial like outreach in the sometimes like the the setup process right so choosing a time with your guest um making sure that you know it's a time that works for both of you obviously we have tools like calendly and google calendar that help us but still you know things happen i think also dealing with like cancellations um, you know, that can be a little bit challenging as a podcaster because you're really, if you're interviewing someone, you really are depending on their availability versus your own. So, you know, that is somewhat of a time sacrifice. And then I would also say, you know, sometimes you have a conversation with someone on a podcast and it's like in your head, it's going to be amazing, but then they get on and it's like not exactly what you thought it was gonna be and that's fine too I think it's it's always good to leave room for um the unexpected but you know if you maybe had a question that you were expecting to go directed one way and it goes complete opposite it's like oh that's not what I thought we was gonna talk about so yeah I mean like podcasting is very it can be like spontaneous I think sometimes with the types of conversations you're having I personally love it though I welcome it all um the good, the bad, the ugly, the unplanned. I welcome all of it. I think it's all a learning experience. So I've been really loving it. I mean, I guess for a lot of folks, it would be also the editing, but thank God we have our co-producer slash my fiance, Eddie, who, or Edway, um, who, you know, edits and produces our episodes. So um, that alleviates a lot on my end um and you know of course like I do a lot of the interview question prep I do all of it actually um and you know creating the social media for the podcast um Angel our community manager also helps a lot with this and she also helps to upload our episodes onto YouTube so by the way if you ever do want to watch the podcast you can just follow us on our YouTube channel um, subscribe and you can actually watch our interviews live there. Um, as far as being a content creator though, Ooh, there's a lot of challenges with being a content creator. I think creating content online now has become a sport. And even within the last four years, like when I started Saudi baddies versus now, oh my gosh, it's like, you know, quadruple the amount of content and pages and brands and you know all of these spaces now and it's it's a lot and I will say it is a little bit challenging sometimes to drown out the noise I also think that not falling into a comparison trap sometimes can be challenging um because you know you put so much of your heart and soul into creating content and you know you want it to go far you want it to go you want it to have the widest reach as possible and I think obviously you know sometimes you put a lot of time and effort into creating something and it just maybe it doesn't land on as many people that you thought it was going to but I think again what's helped me and this this seems to be a common thread in these these questions is not getting too attached to the results and that has really really helped to alleviate a lot of the pressure that I used to feel with creating content Um, and it feels less like a performance now now it's more you know I also don't think that you're Instagram or your business's Instagram should be your business. I think it should be a way to promote what you're sharing. I don't think it should necessarily be the end all be all of your business or what you're creating. So obviously if you're creating content for Instagram, that's great. But you know, at the end of the day, what is your product outside of these apps? And that's why I think it's so important to have things like a website, having a mailing list, having like a YouTube channel. I mean, obviously we have a podcast, but just our Geneva home, like what is it beyond those apps that you have created? Like what is your actual product, you know? And I think redefining what your product is over time 
you know, whereas before I might have said, oh, Sadie Braddies is an Instagram page, but I'm like, no, we're actually, we are a digital community and we are in part also a media company because at the end of the day, we are creating original media and original content in the form of digital media. Um, and it has a very specific subject matter, but that's, that's essentially what it is at the end of the day. So, um, being able to be adaptable with your, um, your content and understanding what direction it's going into is, is really, really valuable. Um, I'm happy to do more of a deeper dive on this, maybe in another episode about content creation, like tips and things like that. Um, I think that's, you know, could be really fruitful, but, um, most challenging part of being a content creator is also just getting like, just burnt out. Um, creative burnout is so real and I've, I've hit creative burnout a few times. Um, and that's when I know it's, it's time for me to take a break. And anytime I take a, like a good, like two, three week social media break, I feel brand new. Like you can't tell me anything. I'm like, I am brand new. She's born again. I feel amazing. And it's just so good for my mental. It's so good for my soul, my spirit, my body. Um, so taking breaks and not getting burnt out and just remembering that this is not real. Like what's real is your feelings, what's real is your body, what's real is the people that you surround yourself with, the love that you have in your life, the experiences that you create, you know, getting offline is so good for your, your soul and reading books, going to museums, going to plays, concerts, having friendship dates, going on romantic dates, whatever it is like that is to me, that's real life. I don't think, you know, being on an app or only having virtual experiences is going to ever supplement what those in-person experiences are. So just remembering that not to take it too seriously at the end of the day, like, so what if you post something and it gets 50 likes, like who cares? You know, at the end of the day, everybody is still living their best life. Everybody's like just trying to have the best experience on this virtual dimension, I would say, as we can, as we possibly can. And so not getting too caught up in the the vanity metrics of it all has helped a lot. And I think the older I get, the more I have a more matured relationship with social media. And yeah, I, I think that social media is a tool. I don't think it is the end all be all. I don't think it is the whole package. It's just part of the otherwise very small component of the actual experience that we're having IRL. So baddies, I hope that you enjoy this little Q and a, it was very chill laid back. I love that. I didn't really have to do too much prep with this and it just felt very natural and I love answering your questions. So if you have more questions, even if you didn't get to get them answered on this episode, send them our way. Again, maybe we will answer more questions in our next season, season five. I can't believe it's season five already, but I just also want to take a quick moment to thank our amazing, amazing guests from this season. First, we had the incredible and the powerful Valencia de la Claybell professor Valencia de la Claybell. She is a force. She was also one of the most um one of the most impactful guest episodes that I think we've had and I say that because her story really 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 touched so many people and um her vulnerability was indescribable and I really just appreciate her presence on the show I appreciate all of our guests so much, and I was honestly moved to tears after our conversation because it was just so powerful. So thank you again, Professor Valencia de la Cribel. Um, We love you. And of course, our girl Kendra, Kendra Austin. She is such a light. I 
loved, 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 loved our episode. It was so beautiful and it just felt like a warm hug and it spoke to so many of you and it was it was one of those episodes that I don't think we'll ever forget. It transcended so many different topics and I think wherever, wherever you are in life, you will find her episode to be particularly helpful, to be particularly be to be particularly useful, and it will resonate deeply with you. And then last but not least, of course, we have the beautiful Amani Rakia. Amani's episode was our most recent episode that we shared. Amani's story and her journey is so interesting. And I loved hearing about how she has just followed her intuition throughout her 20s. And she, you know, is still in her 20s. She's still navigating adulthood, but she's doing it with so much ease and grace and softness. And I love how much we can learn from just her journey and her being open about what it's like, you know, moving across the country, starting over, quitting her job, you know, doing content creation full time. And she's just that girl. She's is she's that girl. Okay. So thank you again to all of our beautiful guests. And um, thank you to our co-producer, Edway. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> so patient and just so understanding. And I cannot do this podcast without you. So thank you so much. And Angel, our community manager, for making sure every episode reaches our beautiful community you have been such a big important part of this whole podcast and i'm just very grateful for my small but mighty team and of course you thank you for listening um i just appreciate you coming every single week coming back to tune into this episodes these episodes it means a lot to me and um just the Saudi baddies team in general. So thank you so much. And I just hope that you have your soft girl summer. I, I think that all the girls, all everybody, everyone deserves their soft life summer. And I'm so excited to come back after this little break, but I'm sending you so much love and stay soft. To stay connected, join Saudi baddies on Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, and more, and sign up for our monthly newsletter on SaudiBaddies.com to stay in the loop. Sending you hella love and stay soft, baddie.